Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today's topic on the mysteries of psychological alchemy was chosen by our community of listeners on Patreon, where supporters like you help us produce episodes. So if you'd like to choose some future topics and help us keep the lights on, click the Patreon link below and give us a hand. So today we're going to be talking about alchemy, which was Jung's last great area of interest. It was controversial for him to study alchemy. In fact, Tony Wolff, his um, great collaborator, ended their relationship because she just thought it was so wrong-minded for him to get into this kind of esoteric mystery. But Jung had come across alchemical writings as part of his general interest in ancient and medieval texts. And what he noticed in the descriptions, and particularly in some of the illustrations from the alchemists, were images and processes that reminded him of dreams and experiences that his analysands were having. And, being enormously curious, when he had a sense of an ancient theme or image showing up in dreams, he ran right towards it. It, in one sense, initially was an, a way to investigate another archetypal and universal layer of the psyche. He was surprised to find out that the alchemists had identified a sequence that started with one object, here we might say lead, and through a series of transformations could become gold. So this was an essential and still remains cornerstone of Jungian analysis, the idea of transformation. Jung was incredibly excited to find proof that the archetype of transformation was something at the foundation at the bedrock of human psyche, and that it activated independently. So when he looked at the ancient alchemists, because they were the early versions of chemists and natural scientists who didn't have any kind of scientific language to describe what they were observing in their experiments, they would project their own unconscious material onto the transformations, often using poetry, religious language, intuitive use and combinations of words to try to capture what they were feeling and observing. And this process of projecting, innocently and naively, projecting their own transformative process onto the chemical operations, gives us what we now have are alchemical texts. Jung psychologized this, so to speak, meaning that he linked it to internal processes that all of us, by the way, all of us are undergoing. And he was able to use that both to describe these very deep, profound changes that happen inside of us. He was able to give that language, to explain it to himself, to give himself a sense of where something might have come from, and most importantly, as Jungians, to give us a sense of where things are going. Hmm. <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to 
delve into this and at least introduce you to this work. And if this really just sets you on fire, <laughs> um, consider reading um, Edinger's book, Anatomy of the Psyche, which does an exquisite job at summarizing these ideas. So, uh, lest we think, as many do, uh, that the uh, long ago alchemists um, were somehow, you know, way off in projecting uh, their own processes onto, you know, rocks and stones and other material substances, our ability to project onto people and items and processes in our worlds today is still very much alive. So uh, through that, if we can step back and take a more objective look, uh, we can track what is going on uh, in the unconscious. What does this mean? Where are we going? And think of alchemy as the archetype of change. Back then, it was the precursor, in a way, to psychology and psychoanalysis. Uh, because those stages of change map onto our own processes of, of change today. So all those strange terminologies have psychological correlates. But basically what alchemy gives us is a symbolism for, for our process of change. It's sort of the anatomy, if you will, of individuation or the search for the philosopher's stone, the opus, the aqua permanence, all terms for uh, reaching individuation's goal of, of wholeness and becoming all that you were innately meant to be. So you guys have given a really good preliminary introduction. It, it feels right to say that this is such an enormous topic, which I think is why we've never done it before. I think we did one episode on the Negredo at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, years ago, um, around 2020, I think, which was fitting. Um, but we're, we're, this is only going to be, we're only going to kind of brush the surface and maybe we can come back and, and revisit perhaps some of the operations in alchemy. But, but uh, as you've both been saying, this, is, this really tracks the transformation, Joseph, you mentioned from lead into gold. So there, there's the idea of the, uh, the, the, the philosopher's stone, that, that which can uh, kind of confer immortality, or it can be the thing that that affects the change. But but it's the process of taking something that um, seems worthless or common, and finding in it uh, something of lasting lasting value. And uh, let's see, maybe one of the first words to kind of lift up is this term opus which is Latin for work. So it's the opus, you're undertaking the work. And it's the work of, in, in, a, in a symbolic sense, it's the work of psychological change. And, and the, the, the alchemists understood the opus to be a, kind of a sacred work that required a religious attitude. And of course, that same thing exists in, in our work too as analysts that uh, the, the work that we undertake as we sit with someone in a process of psychological change requires a certain kind of reverence. So coming in with this correct attitude was really important that sometimes the alchemists would be given these very elaborate uh, descriptions. That you, it might take months to prepare for the operation where you would fast and pray and you would wouldn't eat certain things and do other things. So finding the right attitude. The other thing which I've always thought of with these long preparatory processes is that the analyst, I was going to say, the alchemist analyst is unambivalent in their desire for transformation and that they are willing to sacrifice to cut away other interests, to hone, to create a temenos, so to speak, which means a kind of sacred attitude and sacred space. And they have a one-pointed intention that 
they are going to enter into this work of transformation without any holding back. I also want to just briefly mention something that is unique to Jungian analysis is that if the work were to activate in its fullness, perhaps even reach a con- true conclusion, something would fundamentally transform. Now, in most modern psychologies, the idea of transformation has been rejected. In modern psychology, there's just an improvement of function. Mm-hmm. A reduction that, in symptoms. Yeah, reduction in symptoms. You're going to always be exactly as you are now, but we're just going to try to, you know, just sand it down a little of that rough spot, give you some training wheels so you don't fall off the bike so often, and maybe by the time the end of your life, you won't, you won't be as bruised as you might have been without that help. By the way, that's perfectly fine. It's a kind of educational model and a skill model. But Jung was saying something really radical, which is that the structure of the psyche itself is capable of dissolving and re-coagulating or restructuring on a higher arc. And frankly, no other psychologies are talking about that these days, nor can they demonstrate that efficacy. It's a radical thing. Yeah. So the alchemists devoted themselves uh, to a process. They served something greater. Uh, They served it with with patience and persistence and courage of preparing, getting everything just right. And they talked about it being a sacred process. Mm -hmm. And the corollary that you're um, lifting up, I think, Joseph, is that's what a Jungian analysis hopes to do also, is to effect a change in in us, in a person, a fundamental transformation versus just a change in degree from, oh, I used to get so upset so often, and through the skills that I have learned, um, I don't get quite as upset, and I don't get upset quite so often. Of the, We're looking for what the alchemist called, you know, the, the opus, and Jung called it individuation. And how do we work with our our own uh, transformation, the underlying, undergirding energies of the self, of the unconscious? Uh, how do we how do we do that? Much as the alchemists work with material substances. So, one way to use some of their metaphors is that one. You have to define the thing that you're going to work on, which, means, <laughs> which they call the prima materia. Like, yeah. what's, what's the thing? So for Jungians, it's the psychic structure or the personality. And then the personality undergoes certain experiences, some of which the analyst facilitates. In, I'm going to talk generally, I know we'll become more specific, but In this model of the psyche, your personality exists such as it does right now. And then there's all kinds of other potential, which we call the anima animus, that are hovering somewhere else in the psyche, which you have no idea what it is. And the task is how can your waking personality and all of these totally alien potentials meet and merge and produce a new personality where those traits and capacities are present and active. And the alchemists give us a sense that your personality needs to kind of soften up or in some sense dissolve so that something can be added into it, which is your potential, and then it needs to firm up again so it doesn't all just bleed away or evaporate. I know that sounds simplistic, but that's in one very basic way what they're talking about. Mm. 
I want to just go back to um, that term, the prima materia of uh, the primary or primal material, and you know how what's that like in today's language and world? Uh, basically, the prima materia is the child. You know, it's the child um, that later becomes an adult. The child is innocent, and the child is undifferentiated. You know, we don't have all these separate compartments and aspects of ourselves and capabilities and so on and so forth. Of a newborn baby is a newborn baby, all one thing. Uh, so, so we are working on the parts of ourselves that are undifferentiated. They have not been brought into consciousness. And the processes, alchemical processes, of what needs to dissolve, uh, what needs to regress, and then coagulate or coagulatio of reform in some very different way, of what needs to be burned away, uh, what needs to undergo a process of mortificatio uh, or dying. So, so all of these are the ways that the psyche uh, can begin to work with those undifferentiated parts of ourselves, uh, the prima materia, including um, separatio, separating, sublimatio, rising up above, as if you could see things the way you do when you're on an airplane, for instance, and finally arriving at conjunctio, which is the union of the opposites. Uh, the wholeness. Um, things are differentiated. They don't all just merge into one thing. Um, but all of those various aspects are also connected. Maybe um, to use a metaphor of dance, uh, they interact and dance with one another. So, so um, Deb, that's a really great overview, and, and I'm going to stick for, for just a minute more with this idea of the prima materia, which you said is, is the child, which is, is a great way to think about it psychologically. The idea of the prima materia actually predated alchemy. It went all the way back to the ancients, and it was this belief that this, this is sort of the nature of the universe, that there's sort of a, a single uh, thing there's a single material and everything else gets differentiated out of it, which, by the way, if I understand my, my understanding of um, physics is pretty limited. But I believe that this is also what we believe about the Big Bang, that there, the, you know, all matter, all energy existed in this kind of what's referred to as a singularity. And then there was the Big Bang. And from that, the elements, and I think we know this for sure, the elements kind of accreted out of it. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting how these these metaphors that we intuit have these correlates in, in the scientific world. But in, in, a, in, a, in a way, this is also true. You know, as you said, Deb, we have to kind of coagulate our personality out of the original prima materia of, in, of infancy. But interestingly, and this is the point I wanted to come back to, the alchemists believed that metals had to be changed back into the prima materia before they could be transmuted. So, and Joseph, this goes to what you were saying a minute ago, the, you know, it's one of the basic sayings is, I think we've already said it, is salve et coaglio. Uh, so dissolve and coagulate. And it implies psychologically that for change to happen, we have to go back to a former state before something new can come forward. And although I don't play golf, I will, I have heard golfers <laughs> complain that, you know, if you develop a certain golf stroke, right, and then if you're going to try to improve that, the pro comes and tells you you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, you got to put your weight here, whatever they say. And people's game falls apart at that point. Like they can't play at all. That's the, the salve before they learn the new skill. So, so this is a pattern of uh, that, that you, you, this is also in the psychoanalytic world. It's it's sort of commonly uh, known that that there that you have to regress before you move forward. And and uh, Jung, of course, used a uh, French phrase for that: "recollier pour mieux sauter," uh, which is to kind of go back Ooh, so that's you can impressive. better jump Same forward. Well, <laughs> no, 
I, I think I think that our French <laughs> listeners will be horrified at my pronunciation, but um, but but in any case, it, it again, it's an archetypal pattern that in the in the in a change process, we have to go back to the way we were before, or or sometimes just fall apart and dissolve before we can move forward into a new form. So, if we want to just uh, brush up against the processes a little more. S- Psychologically, Mm -hmm. there's a long list of the various nuanced stages that we can find. The alchemist talked about it in a lovely sequenced way, which makes it seem so wonderfully knowable. But for most of us, it's uh, it's not quite so predictable. We Mm -hmm. do a little bit of one stage and then another stage. We come back, pick up a thread. But the first stage that the alchemists called the negredo which we could think psychologically is that initial stage which is characterized by this experience of chaos and confusion and suffering. Now, in most all of the ancient initiatic traditions, when the initiate was first brought into their very first initiation, they would often be hoodwinked. They would put a a cover over their eyes so that they were blind. And they were often told in the beginning to admit that they are in a state of ignorance and therefore suffering, a state where my sight is not clear. And this admission that there are things going on that are causing me pain, that I am driven to resolve, but I can't see them, that to me is is part of that beginning of the negredo. Some people call it the dark night of the soul, but I think that's actually probably a little bit different. Um, but it's a necessary confrontation with our own suffering, and in a more pure Jungian standpoint, it has to do with the confrontation with the shadow and the repressed mm. and the unconscious parts of the shadow which, as Deb was saying, puts us in touch with the inner infant, which are those primal parts of ourselves that we at one time knew, often when we were quite young, but the culture or other circumstances has caused them to be split off. In the Negredo, we're in that place where Jung has told us one does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, mm-hmm. but by making the darkness conscious. Mm -hmm. And as we continue to pull the shadow into ourselves, as Deb had said around regression, we can feel ourselves reduced to a kind of chaos where the old things we thought about ourselves, oh, I I must always be virtuous, Mm -hmm. isn't that true? And then flies start landing on our soul and laying their (laughs) eggs and (laughs) maggots start. (laughs) <laughs> start moving around inside of us, and then we discover that I, 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 I am really full of um, problems. So in that stage, people can feel depressed and confused and in turmoil. They can lose their direction or their meaning of life. They're confronting their repressions. Oh, am I much angrier than I thought I was? Or I'm more passive? There's often a lot of heightened anxiety. People will have dreams about darkness, dreams about dismemberment, where there's decaying bodies sometimes, or threatening shadowy monsters that are chasing them around the house, or being lost in a forest, or sinking in mud or quicksand. And the resolution of the negredo comes through the acceptance of the shadow and confronting the difficult emotions that we've been avoiding. So Exactly. The individual stays in the darkness and allows the dissolution of the persona to really take place. The next stage is generally the albedo, or the whitening, which they would say is a period of uh, purification or illumination, and that corresponds to coming into a greater state of consciousness. 
and they think of it as a purification. Purification means that we have washed away the things that are alien. So like if you purify water, water is H2O, but if there's a bunch of other chemicals in it, those alien chemicals have to get sifted out so it's pure water. So the albedo becomes part of that wonderful stage of analysis where you've accepted your shadow, which gives you a sense of what your original personality is, and you begin to get a sense of how you've been colonized by other people's ideas, cultural ideas, beliefs that don't really belong to you. And by sensing the alienness of that, we're able to wash that out. And little by little, we become whitened, meaning we become all of one thing, which is really what our true and natural personality is. So people often feel a great sense of relief. They have more clarity. They feel calmer. They feel renewed. They sometimes can feel more philosophical or have more of an interest in spirituality. The albedo can have dreams or bring upon itself uh, dreams of water or flowing. Um, Literally, sometimes people have white figures, a white dog, a white dove, a white stag, dreams of breaking through darkness or lighting a candle, or literally having dreams of bathing. So there is a sense of who one is. The third stage, they call the uh, citrinitas, or the yellowing stage, which is the dawning of wisdom. And the yellowing is thought to be a kind of depositing of gold, so to speak, that if you imagine having just a a white bowl of substance and you drop little flecks of gold into it, that it would take on a bit of a golden sheen. So the white, which is also associated with the unconscious, gets little bits of solar wisdom dropped into it. And that begins to give us a sense of maturity, a sense of balance. So we become more and more conscious of our true potential which is that anima-animus recognition, that we begin to accept that we have a mission that is unique to us, a deeper connection to intuition and creativity. We notice synchronicity more. There's more harmony or light. People sometimes will have dreams of tremendous freedom. We might encounter wise old men or wise old women or mentors in our dreams. I've had people dream of golden orbs or digging in the ground and and finding a lump of gold. And so this stage is marked by a continuing pursuit of self-understanding. Perhaps you're reading Jung's work or listening to this Jungian life, for (laughs) instance. little bits of, of, of gold filter down in. And the final stage in this truncated version is the rubedo. And uh, one of the fun things about the rubedo, um, which is just kind of a fun fact, but uh, in the ancient world, and people were making glass, so you would melt down sand, silica. And uh, the ancient chemists discovered if you put little bits of various minerals in the glass and melt it in, it will change color. So what they discovered is if you add flecks of gold to molten glass, it turns red. So there's a relationship where the gold of the yellowing stage reaches a certain point and the personality which has become more transparent, so to speak, less contaminated, begins to redden because enough wisdom has become integrated 
into the process. So in the truncated version, this is the quote-unquote final stage of alchemy. The union of opposites is completed, the primary opposite being between the ego and the anima animus, which means the self is now perceptible. There's a greater sense of wholeness. This inner marriage has happened. The conscious and the unconscious, the moon and the sun, have come together, and the demarcation between the conscious and unconscious mind is now no longer a wall, but the shore of an ocean. And the ego finds that it can move fluidly between those worlds. This is the philosopher's stone, the philosopher's stone finally being the human personality when it is connected to the self, and therefore it gains the properties of the opus and the philosopher's stone, one of which is the power to heal. And so Jung said with great confidence that the greatest healing agent in the analysis is the analyst's personality if they have done their own work. It becomes something of a philosopher's stone. I know I threw a lot out there. No, 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 it's back. great. I, you know, when, one of the things I wanted to follow up on is that, I don't know about you guys, but it is not uncommon for, for the people. I mean, over the course of years that I've been doing this, I've heard so many dreams where people had some combination of those colors conspicuously, like, oh, there yes. was something black, and then there was something white, and then there was something gold, and, you know, maybe in different uh, kind of um, orders or something. But I, I'm always really struck by that because they're often, when there are these very particular sequence of colors and dreams, they're often these these four colors and maybe not quite in that order. And I, I always, I always feel like it points to some kind of process when colors turn up in a dream, but it's, it's very interesting. Jung said that dreams are the guiding words of the soul. Dream School is our 12-month self-paced online program that teaches you how to understand these important messages from the unconscious. We break down the essential skills teach you how to apply them, and offer opportunities for practice. You can become part of a vibrant community, join a dream group, or share your dream with other students. There are monthly live Q&As with Joseph, a chance for one-on-one -on -one time with Deb in her office hours, and monthly dream seminars with me, Lisa. Visit our website, thisjungianlife.com, to learn more or sign up. What I would like to say is it's not quite such a linear process. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's more, I think, maybe more like a spiral or, you know, back and forth and overall going forward, forward meaning becoming more conscious. But it's not as if one thing sequentially, nicely, and neatly follows the other. And, Unfortunately. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> right. Uh, wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't it be? Uh, and, and it's also all about relationship. Uh, the relationship between you and you that is more than, deeper than uh, ego. All about the relationship between ego and the unconscious in all of its permutations that also connects us to relationships with other people, our relationship uh, with the sacred, with the infinite, uh, our relationship to daily work. So it's all about making connections. Mm -hmm. Although, Deb, I do want to jump in and say that one of the, the interesting things about alchemy as it was practiced is it was generally very solitary. Mm -hmm. You maybe had yes. a kind of assistant, and uh, that might be, a, you know, the, the soror mystica, for example, who might be right. helping you. Right. But, but in general, they, they worked alone. And, and that's one of the ways that it kind of maps onto the analytic process. Exactly. Exactly. That we work alone uh, with an analyst on our shadow. Mm -hmm. So and you go it, into the consulting room and it's like you're in that, uh, you're in that vessel. The laboratory. And the door is closed and it's a closed vessel and there's some kind of change process going on. And the literal secretiveness of alchemy in the, I think, 16th and 17th centuries was because as, as a cultural phenomenon, uh, it was compensatory to and the shadow of 
a, a very rigid, um, well-defined collective uh, Christianity. So it was secretive, literally, in the world, the alchemists practicing out in the woods. And now it maps onto the analytic process just beautifully. Yeah, and, and I, I, I mean, I don't know this for sure, but I think I remember reading this, that you know there were times and places in which the, the practice of alchemy was kind of frowned upon and might be able to get you into a little bit of trouble. A lot of trouble. Okay. So there's something <laughs> transgressive about it. Mm -hmm. And of course, the analytic process is for certain transgressive because it's going to tear down norms and it's going to reorient you. But I, I want to say a little bit more about the point that you just raised about how it was compensatory to Christianity. In this way, it's related to Gnosticism, which is another thing Jung was very interested in. We should perhaps do an episode on that. That'd be great. But the, the idea is that um, Christianity had really um, uh, desold the world. Spirit was separate from matter. But the alchemists were engaging in this process where they were very much interested in the soul that was in matter. They were finding the soul in matter again. So they anthropomorphized uh, the, or theriomorphized the, these elements, they described the metals as people or animals. And perhaps we, we have a, an example of that. I was just thinking the same thing. Let's uh, gi give you a taste of what um, alchemists' language sounded like. Uh, so here it is. Um, the recipe for calcinatio or, or burning, the element of fire or libido, as we would say today. Here it is. Take a fierce gray wolf, which is found in the valleys and mountains of the world, where he roams almost savage with hunger. Cast him to the body of the king, and when he has devoured it, burn him entirely to ashes in a great fire. By this process, the king will become liberated, and when it has been performed thrice, the lion has overcome the wolf and will find nothing more to devour in him. Thus, our body has been rendered fit for the first stage of our work. You know, we read that and we go, what? Right. Um, <laughs> only, only Jung would go, wow, this is so cool. It explains everything. <laughs> it's a recipe. Uh, there was a woman who wrote a, a cookbook famously uh, it, containing a recipe for how to cook a wolf. Um, so it's all metaphorical and symbolic. Because the alchemists were sort of disguising their right. their real purpose and their their work uh, with using terms like the king and wolf and so on. They didn't really mean go capture a wolf and feed it to the king. I mean, I think I think partly they were using that language, like you said, to like disguise and keep it secret. But also, it, it there is a way in which some of them sort of had an intimation that mm. they were not doing what they thought they were doing. I think Jung said that about Paracelsus, yeah. for example. The later alchemists may have developed like a code system, perhaps mm -hmm. to protect their secrets. Exactly. But more interesting to Jung was this innocent fantasy material that right. was used to try right. to describe what was happening. But it would be fun to unpack that um, little paragraph as Jungians. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So <laughs> the king often represents the central um, attitude of the ego, who, who we think we are at this moment. And the body of the king has it's lost all of its life force. It's lying on the ground here. Often this is a midlife depression or worse. However, I've been propping myself up as just lifeless. And then this primordial instinct comes out of the unconscious and gobbles up the ego and fills it full of overwhelming, and as you said, Deb, infantile needs, hunger. I'm hungry for all kinds of things. I want all these things, I, or I've n never gotten all these things. And then if we're in analysis, hopefully, all of that, all of that need is contained and not permitted to act out. Because if you start screaming at everybody, stealing things or tearing your world apart because 
you deserve everything because now you're a hungry infant. That's not going to work. You contain it, and the frustration of those primordial infantile needs burns something down to ash. And then at that point, something underneath the unmet needs begins to surface, which is suggested in the lion. And the lion finally comes forward, which is the true, the king of beasts. It's the true archetype of the ego in its new state. And so then another stage of work can begin because the lion goes from being the green lion to the yellow lion to the red lion. But by the frustration of the primordial instincts, the wolf, we then are changed. So the wolf eats the king, or the green lion eats the sun, but some primordial monster gobbles up the symbol of the ego. And as Deb said, that's a, re- a regression, it has to be contained, which means I'm in analysis and I just want to rip everybody's heads off. And the analyst says, you can talk about it here, you can fantasize it, but you must not act on it. It's the fuel, the fire. It's going to burn the old stuff down and a new temple will be made in three days, which is a metaphor for many years of analysis. (laughs) (laughs) Much said, greater amounts of things that are not said. Maybe one day Mm -hmm. we'll do a whole live workshop with all of you coming to us, and we can really work through alchemy because it's such an enormous thing. But I thought that we could finish up by having a fantasy about What might a human being look like who had completed all the stages of the alchemical transformation? How could we fantasize what they would call the adept? And so here's some of my fantasies. Is that when the opus is well completed, that you would experience yourself as complete, as centered, having a sense of inner peace and inner authority, no longer feeling fragmented, having a a profound sense of wholeness and self-acceptance, that you would know what your strengths and weaknesses are without shame or denial, having accepted both the light and dark sides of your personality, that you would have a strong sense of purpose and meaning in your life, understanding the unique path that you are aligned with, and inhabiting that authentically, that you might experience a deep, unwavering self-confidence that does not rely on external validation, but is grounded in knowing and accepting who you are with your limitations and potentials, and that you are connected to something larger than yourself, whether that's the collective unconscious or a spiritual reality, but something universal is intimately companioning your sense of self. Such a person, when they look upon other people, would likely feel compassion, empathy, understanding. That the adept would recognize the inner struggles and the unconscious forces at play within other people because they have discovered them in themselves. But the empathy is drawn from the journey through psychological darkness, that you would honor the individuating processes of others, that you might see beyond the persona mask, that your interactions might be marked by authenticity and transparency, and that you would constellate around you a feeling of calm, centered, non-reactive engagement. 
Sounds really nice. We'll let you know when we all get there. I know. <laughs> and and we we have so much more to say about alchemy, as you said, but I think it's time for us to switch to a dream. Okay, here we go. Our dreamer is a woman. She's 25, works as a healthcare assistant, and has entitled her dream, Pregnant Without a Bump. And here's the dream. Pregnancy dream. I was pregnant, and in the third trimester, I wasn't showing much of a bump and was worried that I wasn't actually pregnant and thinking about whether I'd actually had scans or not. I recalled that I definitely had scans, so I just wasn't showing that I was pregnant for some reason. I remember saying to someone in the dream that when my mom was pregnant with me, she barely had any bump, and that she could still wear a size 8 dress when she was just a few weeks away from giving birth to me. I kept touching my stomach and trying to feel the bump, wondering why I hadn't felt the baby kick or anything. And for context, she says, I'm about to start a counseling degree at university, and after ending a relationship recently, I'm single for the first time in 10 years. The main feelings in the dream, she says, were being excited about having a baby, scared of giving birth, confused about why there was nothing to show that I was pregnant, and worried that there wasn't actually any baby there. Uh, for associations, she offers that she's very close to her mother. Well, of course, pregnancy is a wonderful metaphor that shows in, up in dreams uh, for all kinds of people, whether they're men, women, have had children or haven't had children, that it, it's a metaphor for gestating something new. And oftentimes what's being gestated is the new attitude. And here there, there is a, a significant life transition happening. She's beginning a, a counseling degree, which, you know, I, I think, I mean, obviously that's academic work, but I certainly remember in my MSW program, even though it was, you know, you completed assignments, you went to class, you did the reading, the topic meant that it was constantly rubbing up against your own stuff, you know, kind of rattles your cage. So anytime we're doing this sort of academic work, it certainly uh, is also to some extent or another a change process. And, and sometimes by design in the case of analytic training, but I think even when it's not. And of course, being single for the first time in 10 years. So, so something new is growing has been growing for some time. And it just doesn't show. She can't feel it. Uh, maybe she doesn't feel it yet in consciousness. You know, it would be just as in pregnancy of the bump is there, uh, the baby kicks, uh, conscious and uh, what is growing within are connected in very literal ways. So it shows a little bit of a distance between ego and, and this process that psyche is imaging as pregnancy. But I don't feel it yet. Mm -hmm. But yeah. there it is. I've had the scans. Mm -hmm. And I think that is such a great metaphor for a lot of things. Often in dreams, uh, people will say, I was observing something. You know, and the other figures in the dreams were doing this, that, or the other thing. So it's at the first stage of approaching, which is still part of us is removed from it. Part of us hasn't really connected with it in a fully felt way. I think that all makes sense that we're often in that stage where somebody or somehow our potential has been assessed. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I. I took the aptitude test. It says the, that I did this. I took my GRE or a, the SATs, and it says that I, you know, I belong in Princeton. But uh, here I am, and there's no evidence that I actually 
am as smart as people tell me I am or that I can write the way I thought I could write or can I really be a counselor? I when I got into analytic training, I kept on expecting them to write and say that they'd actually made a mistake. Yeah. This is a dream about maybe imposter syndrome. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Like, and uh, so That's she's great. worried. I like that. I like that. I, I like it. I like it too. And we've all been there of, of they said I could do it, but, and here I am, but. I'm not. Fe- I'm not feeling it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, um, I, I well, the other thing that I find interesting about not having a bump is um, having been pregnant more recently than either of you, which it was still a heck My of a long time ago. My pregnancy was just terrible. Like. <laughs> <laughs> is um, it's it's you know, it's the secret that you carry until you start showing, and then once you start showing, everyone sort of like. <gasps> Oh, oh, you know, and sometimes strangers mm-hmm. come up and yeah. put their, you know, and feel your belly. It's really, it's really very weird. It becomes public, but it, 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 before you have the bump, no one can see it. No one knows. So yes. there's a, there's a, you know, we're sort of yeah. talking about the alchemy process, you know, that it's very individual, but, but there is, there is something about, which I think relates very much to what you're saying, Joseph, about the kind of, uh, imposter syndrome it's like well well i th- i think this is true but it's not there's no kind of outward evidence of it yeah so, so if i take that the main feelings of the dream she writes i was excited about having a baby scared of giving birth confused about why there was nothing to show and i was pregnant and worried there wasn't anything actually a baby in there and so if i change the language i was excited about being a counselor but scared <laughs> about launching a new career and confused that there was no way i could prove that i was a counselor and i was worried but maybe I actually don't have it in me to be a counselor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Uh, that's, that's great. great. <laughs> yeah, that's really great. I, I want to shift over to a part of the dream that I think is also interesting. Um, that she says to someone in the dream, which mm-hmm. may also have happened in, quote, real life, unquote, when my mom was pregnant with me, she barely had any bump and could still wear a size eight dress just a few weeks away from giving birth. Mm-hmm. So I'm just wondering about whether there's something in her history uh, and in her mother complex about uh, being able to hold on to and preserve uh, your former self and the appearance of being svelte uh, and fashionable and whatever else, uh, rather than waddling around in the world uh, with this great big bump uh, showing everybody. So, so the, the evidence that the, the, the mention of the dress, you know, one of the things that we wonder about in dreams when there's an item yes. of clothing mentioned yeah. is whether or not it might relate to persona. So I'd be curious about the mother's maybe persona and, and what her relationship is with that. I mean, it's just a possibility. I also was struck by the fact that it's a size eight dress and she's <laughs> in her third trimester, which would be, you know, the, you know, around the eighth month. So I'm just I'm wondering about I'm wondering about that and wondering if there's any special significance mm-hmm. to eight. And I also would be really curious if the streamer here were to say, what happened eight months ago in your life? Eight-ish uh, months ago. You know? Yeah. That's and, a great and was that when you were applying to graduate school? Was that when you were it was first uh occurring to you that maybe this relationship wasn't gonna go the different distance and you might need to end it? Was there was there something you know, when did the gestation happen, you know, for this pregnancy? Yeah, that's great. And I'm thinking about the great uh, periods of a woman's life from time immemorial of maiden mother crone. And whether there's something in the family history of uh, some ambivalence about trans- transitioning from maiden to mother uh, by having a great big bump versus mm-hmm. being able to still appear uh, as as a maiden in a size eight dress. I'd like to throw just a little curveball into this as well, that sometimes when people go into psychotherapeutic training, that they often have a fantasy that they're going to behave in a mothering fashion <laughs> towards mm-hmm. their clients. Mm-hmm. Isn't it like I'm going to be loving and I'm going to, tend to people just the way my mom is, who I'm really close to. And so she's going into the program. She thinks she's pregnant, meaning I think this is going to transform me into being a mom. 
but the baby hasn't kicked or anything. And so what it may be is that you're not pregnant, you're not going to be a mom, and that what is going to awaken in you as a counselor is actually different from mothering your clients. Mm. And that could be surprising or maybe even sad if that was an unconscious fantasy. Because being a therapist might involve you being very confrontive or even sometimes rather cool about things or a whole other way of approaching the relationship with the client and what might be at the risk of upsetting but stillborn inside of you mm-hmm. is a fantasy about the profession which isn't really going to survive the educational process yeah that's but interesting hopefully something much more interesting mm-hmm. <laughs> could come forward and much mm-hmm. broader and more fulsome yeah. than kind of mothering your clients. Mm -hmm. And it will be interesting, always. (laughs) Yeah, I like that. I like that, Joseph. That's really good. Yeah. Thanks for listening. To submit a dream, suggest an episode topic, or join our mailing list, visit our website, thisunionlife.com. If you enjoyed this episode, give us five stars and a good review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure to click the notification bell to be alerted whenever we upload new videos. And keep up with all things TJL by following us on Instagram, Facebook, X, and TikTok.